Parliament still in session. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 13663 in the name of Linda Fabiani on East Kilbride workers say nay pass Saran. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Linda Fabiani to open the debate. Ms Fabiani, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, presiding officer. Two days ago, Tuesday of this week, 11th of September, marked the 45th anniversary of the vicious right-wing coup that brought General Augusto Pinochet to power in Chile the start of a reign of terror that lasted for far, far too long. Before the 1973 coup, Chile was a democracy. They had elected Salvador Allende as president in 1970, and he was the leader of the Popular Unity Coalition. President Allende appointed Augusto Pinochet as commander in chief of the military in 1973, and within weeks, the coup was launched with heavy attacks on the presidential palace by the Chilean Air Force using Hawker Hunter fighter jets. The elected government was overthrown, President Allende died, and democracy and civilian rule was ended with the suspension of Congress and the advent of dictatorship. Socialists, leftists, and political critics were persecuted. Thousands were killed, with tens of thousands more tortured or jailed for political reasons. Some of us in the chamber today Remember the horror of watching events unfold on our televisions and being aware of the political activists, artists, intellectuals and workers who fled Chile with their families. For me, the starkest image is that of Santiago Stadium, the Chilean National Football Stadium being turned into a concentration camp and execution centre. I remember discussing the horror of that with my father with the disbelief of a teenager that such events happened in a world that was supposed to be civilised. And worse, as time went on, the realisation that despite the horror, cordial relations with the man who instigated all of this were established with governments across the world. It's thought that around 500 Chilean exiles ended up in Scotland. Many Scots campaigned and showed solidarity with their Latin American contemporaries in demonstrations, in fundraising, in friendship, in song. One notable song was that of Adam McNaughton, who wrote Blood Upon the Grass about the Scotland football team going to play in Santiago Stadium. The Chile Solidarity Campaign had membership across the UK, and I understand as one example of solidarity, a group of Chilean workers were sponsored by Cowdenbeath's mining community. East Cobride at that time was home to the Rolls-Royce factory that repaired and maintained the Avon engines, the engines that powered the Hawker Hunter jets, one of the UK's most exported military aircrafts. That's the subject of Ne Passaran, the film that tells the story of East Cobride's heroes. And can I say, presiding officer, there's two of these heroes in the gallery with us today, Bob Fulton and Stuart Barry. A few months after Chile's coup, back in 1974, engine inspector Bob Fulton arrived at work at the factory. The note of his next repair job said that the engines were from the Chilean Air Force. Bob realised that these engines would be from the planes involved in Pinochet's attack on democracy, and no doubt in the ongoing abuses of the Chilean people. He was anxious, he was upset, and he made a decision. He was not working on these engines. His colleagues backed him. The workers in the Rolls-Royce factory in East Kilbride boycotted the Chilean Air Force engines. They kept that boycott going for four years with the engines being left to rust. One night, though, the engines mysteriously disappeared and the workers were told that their actions had been meaningless. Years, decades passed. Bob Fulton and others moved on, retired, and, of course, some of them are no longer with us. Meanwhile, filmmaker Felipe Bustos Sierra, also in the gallery, I'm glad to say, son of a Chilean exile, grew up hearing rumours about this act of solidarity. Felipe was fascinated by the story and determined to find out whether this was myth or reality. The start was turning up to speak to Bob Fulton, 
some 40 years after the Rolls Royce workers' action. That was the beginning of the making of the film, Ne Passaram. The first project was a short documentary, an excellent short film, and following that, a successful crowdfunding, which enabled the full-length feature to be made. That was the full-length feature which premiered at the Glasgow Film Festa Festival earlier this year to rave reviews from critics and the public, and indeed to our Cabinet Secretary for Culture. I've been privileged to see the film a few times, and it's truly marvellous in its story, in its investigation, its interviews with key players, in its research by Felipe Bustos Sierra in unearthing this fascinating story, and indeed in the quality of its production. The stars of the film are four men, four ordinary chaps who worked in Rolls Royce in EK in 1974, and with others potentially put their jobs on the line to stand up for their principles. Bob Fulton, Robert Somerville, John Keenan and Stuart Barry. That couldn't have been easy, not just in the workplace, but in everyday life. Bob Fulton admits in the film that he was feared to go home to his wife Lottie and tell her what he'd done. So what had they done? It's simple. Bob, Robert, John and Stuart and their fellow workers did what they knew to be right. What they didn't know was the effect that this had. What they didn't know was that Felipe Busto Sierra would turn up decades down the line to let them know about that effect. What they didn't know was that during the making of a film about the Rolls Royce engines, they would meet Chileans who were persecuted during the Pinochet regime. Fellow workers, incarcerated, tortured, and afraid of execution, who told them that they took some comfort from the fact that they knew that way over in a place called East Kilbride in Scotland, there was a bunch of workers who refused to repair Pinochet's jet engines. There's so much more I could say about Ne Passaram presiding officer. The excellent representation of the situation at the time, the filmed interviews, the politics, not just of Chile, but of the UK and other Western governments. But time limits me. You have to see the film. Let me end by, as I, in the parliamentary motion I laid, recognising the achievement of Felipe Busto Sierra in making this film. And by recognising the determination of all those workers in the Rolls Royce factory in East Kilbride in the 1970s who took part in the boycott of Pinochet's jet engine. A stand against fascism in defence of the democratic rights of the Chilean people. This is a film which depicts a remarkable piece of Scotland's industrial history and illustrates an admirable act of solidarity between Scottish workers and the Chilean people. This is a film which once seen will not be forgotten. East Kilbride is extremely proud of its heroes who said, Ne Passaran. <laughs> Thank you. Can I say very gently to members in the public gallery, we do not permit applause from the gallery. I understand why people want to do it, but please desist. Uh, I'm now moving on. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr. Simpson, please. Thank you. Um, can I thank Linda Fabiani for bringing this uh, motion to the chamber? Because it celebrates a, a key moment in the history of my hometown, East Kilbride. Nay, passaran, they will not pass. Now, if my pronunciation is a bit dodgy, my Spanish-speaking daughter will be sure to let me know. In September 1973, 45 years ago, General Pinochet launched a military coup against the government of Chile. Airstrikes using British-built Hawker Hunter planes targeted the presidential palace, and the president was killed. 7,000 miles away in Lanarkshire, Rolls-Royce engineer Bob Fulton and I'm delighted to see Bob here today, saw a Hawker Hunter engine in front of him with the word Chile written on it. He'd seen footage of the airstrikes and was so incensed that he refused to service four engines. And risking their jobs, Bob and his colleagues kept these four engines in crates in the yard for four years. The Rolls-Royce engineers were adamant that these engines were staying put and would not re-enter service. They believed these engines, without necessary protection, would have corroded over the years had they sat in a crate in the factory yard. And mysteriously, as Linda Fabiani has said, the engines were removed one night in 1978. What happened to them exactly 
is not clear. There were reports they made it back to Chile. As Linda Fabiani has said, there's a film of this story made by Chilean Felipe Bustos Sierra, and I do apologize, Felipe, if I've got that wrong as well. He grew up in Belgium and said, and I'm gonna quote extensively here, in Belgium, we would go to solidarity events where they'd roll off a list of actions taken throughout the world in protest against the torture and censorship by the Pinochet regime. The Scottish boycott was always mentioned, even after the engines had disappeared. It gave us a lot of hope because it dealt directly with the most iconic image of the Chilean coup, the planes flying low over Santiago and firing rockets into the city center. Over time, the story became a bit of a myth with lots of embellishments and exaggerations. Initially, I was hoping to find the workers involved and set the record straight, but never imagined I'd find so much uh, about how much of an impact they'd had. Our discoveries uh, surprised not just the workers, but the Chilean Air Force itself. The story had been buried so deep back then they allowed us some access, convinced we wouldn't find anything tangible. And then we did. In 2015, as a result of our research, three of the Scottish workers received the highest honor given to foreigners by the government of Chile for their efforts to preserve human rights. They're now commanders of the Republic of Chile." End quote. I haven't seen the film, but I would like to. Rolls-Royce is part of East Kilbride's history. Sadly, the firm has left the town uh, and with no legacy save for a housing development called Merlin Gardens. And what a pity that is. This film may be all that's left of that history. We should celebrate it. Thank you very much. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Sandra White. Ms. Lennon, Thank you please. very much, Presiding Officer. As MSPs, we are asked to support uh, many, many motions. Sometimes it feels like hundreds a week, but I was genuinely delighted to see uh, the motion um, in Linda Fabiani's name and delighted that she has secured support for this, for this really important debate. Um, East Cobride is just down the road from me. I live in Blantyre and it's in the, the region that I represent. So the remarkable contribution of the Rolls-Royce workers to Scotland's industrial history is of special significance to me and our shared constituents. Um, I've known about the story for, for some time, but not well enough. So I think Linda Fabian is absolutely right. You just have to see the film. And aggressively, I haven't been able to find the time to do that yet. And I'm very jealous of friends who've seen it not just once, but, but a couple of times already. So it's on my to-do list. Um, I want to add my gratitude to the heroic engineers, Bob Fulton, Robert Somerville, Stuart Barry and John Keenan, and all of the workers who took part in the boycott, and to commend the filmmaker Felipe Bustos Sierra uh, for basically educating the world about this remarkable part of our history, the very best of our humanity, and a special welcome to, to Bob and Stuart and Felipe who are in the gallery. Um, Linda Fabian has set the scene already for what happened back in the 70s, which was just before I was born, but she is right, that brutal dictatorship in Chile lasted far too long. According to Chilean government accounts, over 3,000 people died or disappeared, and as many as 28,000 were tortured, and to this day, relatives continue to search for lost loved ones. So this debate allows us to remember the dead, but also show our solidarity for the living, including the people who arrived in Scotland as refugees of that regime of terror and have made Scotland their home. As we've heard, and after the coup, the military jet engines from Chile were in need of vital repairs and were returned to, to East Gobride, to, to the Rolls-Royce factory. And quite simply, on moral grounds, the workers refused to repair these engines. And that act of protest started remarkably with one person, one worker, Bob Fulton, and that is truly inspiring because what happened next it shows you that the importance of of workers organizing the importance of being part of a trade union and that 4,000 workers um, unanimously agreed to follow suit and support Bob um, and that unity was crucial to the success of the the protests um, I think the workers in Rolls-Royce um, they understood a, an injury to one is an injury to all and they have shown us the true meaning of solidarity and internationalism 
And as a, a Lanarkshire woman, I'm also proud that uh, others in politics were taking up this fight, and notably Dame Judith Hart, who was then the Minister of Overseas Development in the Labour government, an MP in, in Lanark. Judith was one of the very few women uh, in Westminster at that time, and she used her position to fight poverty and injustice from Lanarkshire to Chile. She was a formidable advocate for socialism and her un unwavering support of Chile against Pinochet earned her the Chilean Order of Merit. The title of the film, Ne Passaran, is of course the, the Scottish interpretation on the, the Spanish words for they shall not pass. And it speaks to the very best of, I think, Scottish culture and our character. And in that spirit, the workers not only refused to repair the engines, but actively obstructed their removal from the factory. And we've heard more about that, that the engines were left to, to rust in the yard. Um, I think what's also, you know, what adds to the mystery is that, you know, the, the, the workers didn't really understand the impact of, of, of what they had done. And um, I think because of Felipe's uh, film that we're, we're able to now fully under, uh, appreciate that. Um, and I think it's, it's very moving today that we're actually paying tribute in the Scottish Parliament because I hope that, that everyone involved feels that we're all you know, immensely proud. And, and I hope that um, not just young people in Nisco Bride and, and workers in Nisco Bride in Central Scotland, but I think everyone in Scotland has to see uh, this film. So I know we're short of time and I'll, I'm overdue, over past my time already. So thank you, uh, President Officer, but thank you to Linda Fabiani and to everyone for, for letting this story uh, be told. Thank you. I call Sandra White to be followed by Ross Greer. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, can I thank you? Uh, I'm very grateful to Linda Fabiani, my colleague, for securing this important debate and also to Bob Fulton, Robert Somerville, John Keenan and Stuart Barry, two of who are in the audience today uh, in the gallery, for what I would call their very courageous stance and solidarity with the people of Chile against the military coup of Pinochet and the ongoing violence perpetrated against them. And as has been mentioned before, the many thousands of what they called missing. And that's what I remember most people even still looking years and years later for their loved ones. A, a terrible, terrible uh, thing to happen. And unfortunately, in some countries in the world, it's still going on. So basically, I really do thank you for what you have done. And I hope people would have the courage <laughs> to stand in solidarity in other areas of the world as it is just now. Presiding officer, the Chilean coup on the 11th of September 1973 was a landmark of the Cold War. First democratically elected left-wing president in Latin America, Salvador Allende, uh, was brutally overthrown by the Chilean armed forces. Uh, surrounded and attacked, presidential palace has already been said, with Allende and his staff uh, basically refused to surrender. And we know that Allende died that day and the dictatorship that followed which had killed hundreds and thousands of people and uh, many, as I said, disappeared and still been sent to exile and still looking for their people. Now, the Hunter Hawk air raid uh, during the Chilean coup on the 11th of September 1973, has been said before, really caught the, the, the public's, not imagination, but it was put forward through filmmakers that travelled the world and when the Scottish workers, as already been said, saw these images on the television, they recognised that their planes, planes that they were building, they knew immediately that they were working on these same engines. Uh, the Hunter, the Hawker Hunter, was one of Britain's most exported military uh, aircraft. 20 air forces flew them, and all of them were powered by the same engine, and it was Rolls-Royce Avon. Now, we all know that in the 1970s, all of these engines uh, were repaired in the same factory, Rolls-Royce East Cobride. And funny enough, my own husband, not at that time, but a few years later, uh, did work in the Rolls Royce and East Cobride as well. Uh, there was only place that you could have maintenance ongoing there. So the boycott of these Chilean uh, engines at that factory was a cause celeb. It was a fantastic thing to do. And the workers kept that boycott up going, going for four years. And as already been said, uh, the engines were left to rust at the back of the factory. And then one night, the engines disappeared. And we don't know where they ended up, but I'm sure some people would have an answer to that. Now, as Linda Fabiani has already mentioned, 
the filmmaker who's here today also, Felipe Buster Sierra, uh, son of a Chilean exile, uh, basically, son of a Chilean exile, grew up hearing rumours of uh, this tale of international solidarity. And one of the questions which I believe he asked, another did, was any of this true? And of course, we know it was true. And from there, Neil Passaran uh, was documented and the film was created. Uh, a film of the many Chileans who crossed paths with the engines and also what happened to these people. And I believe that we are actually in a negotiation in the Scottish Parliament to show the film in November. Uh, so hopefully we can get uh, an update on that. Perhaps the CABSEC might be have a, an update. Sorry to put you on the spot, but perhaps <laughs> it may have anyway. But I just, I know I'm sort of running out of time, but I, I want to, uh, you know, comment on, well, actually repeat the comments of John, Robert and Bob, who were at the medal ceremony in Glasgow. And what they said at that time was, if international solidarity means anything to you, if you believe that we do, that we are all connected, trying to make a life for ourselves, for others, while treating each other like human beings before politics, class, language, or anything muddles it up, this is a story for you. It has been painstakingly documented, but it has a happy ending. And gentlemen, I salute you and everyone else who stands up to fascists and dictators. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. I remind the members in the gallery, the audience of the gallery, not to applaud speeches. Some people have come in since I said that. It's, um, I understand why, but I'm afraid that's a rule in the Parliament. Can I call Ross Greer to be followed by Neil Finlay? Mr. Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Linda Fabiani for giving us the opportunity to thank and to celebrate the workers of Rolls Royce East Kilbride and the many other examples of Scotland's working class internationalism and solidarity. As has been mentioned, this past Tuesday marked the 45th anniversary of the American-backed coup against the democratically elected president of Chile, uh, Chile, Salvador Allende. That brought about the murderous dictatorship of the fascist general Pinochet. Allende had sought to implement socialist policies in Chile, including government provision of health care and education, fair redistribution of land, public works projects, and most critically, nationalizing industry, particularly the copper mines that had previously been owned by US interests. This in particular was almost universally popular in Chile, far beyond the political left. He even supported a proto-internet project, Pro Project CyberSign, a network of telex machines to facilitate fast and effective decision-making for state-run enterprises to manage a nationalized economy. And I don't hesitate to admit that I had to Google what a telex machine is before um, putting together this speech. Allende's government was a progressive one. Unsurprisingly, the US didn't like that. They feared a loss of American investments in Chile, they feared Chile might become the next Cuba. The US took action to destabilize the country, culminating in the coup, significantly instigated by the CIA and US military personnel. When the Chilean military moved against them, Allende refused to surrender or to flee. He had the opportunity to move south, to lead an insurgency from the south of the country, but his politics were rooted in the belief that progressive change can be brought about and should be brought about democratically and peacefully. So instead, he remained in the presidential palace as the military moved in. Those loyal to him held out for hours, for as long as they could, completely surrounded and without any chance of rescue. Eventually, the building was set alight and bombed by the Air Force jets that have brought us to this debate today. In his farewell address to the nation, he railed against the coup. He stated his belief in a better democratic future for Chile. All the while, you can hear the gunfire and the explosions in the background around him. He shot himself rather than be captured by the new regime. And over the next 17 years, the horrendous human rights abuses that took place in Chile continued to escalate. Tens of thousands of people were tortured, hundreds of thousands exiled, thousands executed, and many simply disappeared. Terror was institutionalized in Pinochet's Chile. Infrastructure was created, torture centers were built, government agencies were dedicated to the task of oppression. When you're faced with horrendous human rights abuses in a country thousands of miles away, it can be difficult to know what to do, how you can make a difference. But for the workers of Rolls-Royce and East Kilbride, what they could do was clear. Rolls-Royce manufactured the engines used in jet fighters, not just used by the Chilean Air Force, but 20 Air Forces across the world. And the East Kilbride site was, at that point, the only one at which those jet engines could be serviced. By refusing to service the engines, the workers were able to take a stand. They did everything in their own power to frustrate and to undermine a fascist dictatorship 7,000 miles away. They grounded jets used to bomb an elected government and to terrorize a people and they gave strength to those in Chile who continued to resist. Stuart Barry, who I'm delighted is here today, was one of the workers who led that action. He said, and I quote, years later, we heard that folk in Chile were inspired by us. 
we've met a guy who was in prison being tortured, and he said he heard about our action on the radio that his guard had. He said it gave him the will to live. It was a wee spark of life. It lifted him up. It takes courage to take a stand like what the workers in East Kilbride did, and it takes strong unions and collective actions to sustain it. What those workers did was a proud moment in a proud history of working class solidarity in Scotland, often in the face of UK governments happier to dine with dictators and condemn those standing against them. The evil that the workers in East Kilbride defied in the 70s, though, is not something only of our past. Brutal regimes still exist, and so do their links with Scotland. Missile systems manufactured by Raytheon and Fife for the Saudi Air Force have been linked to war crimes in Yemen, including the bombing of hospitals, funerals, and just a few weeks ago, 40 children slaughtered on a school bus. Despite this clear link between a factory in Scotland and terrible human rights abuses abroad, Raytheon are still given public money in this country. Over £200,000 has been given to the world's largest guided missile manufacturer, and it's far from the only arms trader to receive such funds. Today we celebrate the actions of Scottish workers who defied a dictator thousands of miles away. I hope the Scottish Government will be inspired enough by their story to end the support being given this very day to those who supply equally brutal regimes. This would be a powerful demonstration that Scotland's strong tradition of international solidarity lives on. Thank you. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Willie Coffey. Mr uh, Finlay, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and I'd like to thank Linda Fabiani for bringing uh, this debate forward. And, the, uh, and we have had some fantastic uh, speeches, I have to say. The, um, if we look back at the, uh, the history and the election of Allende, um, that time shook America to its core because we have to remember this is only a decade or so after the Cuban Revolution that we actually saw a, a democratically elected uh, left-wing socialist government uh, in the backyard of the United States. And that sparked powerful vested interests of the political right because they saw their grip on power being wrenched away, not wrenched away by a coup, but wrenched away by democracy. And that's what all of this was about because Allende's uh, coalition set about implementing that program of land redistribution, of nationalization, of uh, reducing unemployment, increasing wages, of social reform, and as Ross Greer says, health and education. That really struck a chord with those who previously held power because this was the polar opposite of what they wanted. They didn't want to lift uh, working people and peasants out of poverty or improve the economy or develop social services. They wanted to retain power in their base. Uh, and they actively and quickly organized and conspired, ultimately launching that violent coup on September the 11th with the assassination and overthrow of the government. And that, that footage that people have spoken about of the jets bombing the presidential palace, of key government buildings being attacked, I think are the haunting images of that whole time. Uh, I have not yet uh, seen the whole film. Uh, I hope to see it next week at my party's conference in Liverpool, where there will be a, a, a showing. But I'm very aware of the story because it's one of the great campaigns in the history of the Scottish trade union and labour movement. Uh, because it's a story about class unity. That's exactly what it's about. Workers thousands of miles, thousands of miles apart, thousands of miles away from South America, taking action. And remember, direct action by refusing to service engines des destined for uh, persecution and oppression. It's an example of the very, very best values of the labour and trade union movement. Workers identifying an injustice that was an affront to their sense of morality, their sense of right and wrong, and belief in democracy and human rights. Their refusal to work on the engines had a direct impact. It meant that some of those planes were grounded, undoubtedly saving lives and preventing more misery. This was a practical step. And the actions of the workers in the Shop Stewards Committee, remember, it's, this was not taken in self-interest. It wasn't about improving their pay or their conditions. It was a purely, purely humanitarian act of solidarity. Uh, Tony Benn said democracy is one of the most revolutionary acts, and that is why so many people oppose it. Well, I would add, that solid, add solidarity to that. I think it's one of the greatest acts of compassion that human beings who don't know each other can show each other. Uh, following the coup, we know that Chile became a laboratory for neoliberal shock doctrine as the Pinochet regime let the free market rip while persecuting 
torturing and killing thousands and thousands of people. The lucky ones fled to different countries and we know that I think around 500 settled here. Welcomed by trade unions, welcomed by, by uh, mining communities, by churches and charities and others. And I think that again shows compassion and solidarity. And I want to congratulate the filmmakers and the shop stewards and all the workers, some of whom are no longer with us, who stood up using the greatest tool that workers have, and that is the withdrawal of their labour. And as we witness the rise of Trump, the far right on the march again, extreme nationalism across Europe, then the left and progressive forces must organise to resist such vile ideology, that of fascism. Uh, Ross Greer was right also to point out what is happening in this country today in terms of supplying weapons to ODS regimes. Finally, I would say I think the title of the film says it all. Ne passaran. Thank you. And before I call Willie Coffey, can I say in view of the number of speakers remaining to, to take part in today's debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes and, and ask Linda Fabiani if she would move such a motion. Uh, moved, presiding officer. Are members in agreement? Thank you. No members having disagreed, I therefore extend this debate under rule, standing order rule 8.14.3. And I now call Willie Coffey to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Thanks very much, presiding officer. And what a pleasure it is to be part of this, this debate and this commemoration. And thank you also to, and congratulations to Linda Fabiani for bringing this debate to Parliament today to mark the wonderful act of international solidarity shown by Scottish workers at Rolls-Royce in East Cobride between 1974 and 1978 to the people of Chile in their fight against the fascist dictator Augusto Pinochet. I watched the short film last night and what was impressive about it was the men's steadfast conviction about their action and that their action hadn't changed a bit over the years. When they saw the film clips of their own Rolls-Royce Avon engines flying over Santiago, to bomb and kill people and put down a democratically elected government, they decided to take action when the chance arose. And it certainly did ground in half the Chilean Air Force as a result. When the engines came to East Kilbride to be serviced and returned to Chile, the men said, no. And they kept saying, no, ne passaran. And I'm sure they would say exactly the same today if they were asked. It was also moving too to witness that silent moment of the sadness when the Chilean filmmaker revealed to the men that the engines did go back to Chile eventually, probably sneaked out by the company on the instructions of the government, despite the fact that the men were sure the engines couldn't be used since they were probably corroded. Little did they calculate that that wouldn't matter a jot to Pinochet. I think in fact, one of the engines did it fly again and subsequently crashed some years later. The coup in 1973 was backed by the Americans and Chilean government figures have put the number of deaths and disappeared around the 3,000 mark. Around 10,000 were held as political prisoners and tortured, probably much more than that in reality, and around 200,000 people we think fleeing into exile. My clearest memory of the situation in Chile was around 1977, when I was a student at Strathclyde University. Scotland, as Linda Fabiani said, was scheduled to play a football match against Chile as part of our warm-up tour for the 1978 World Cup in the stadium where thousands were held and many were tortured and killed. I can still recall a mature, a mature student, a Chilean, talking to me at length about what had happened there and that Scotland shouldn't play the game. Huge controversy surrounded it, and the SFA told everyone the game would go ahead unless the UK government instructed otherwise. Well, they didn't, and the match went ahead with Scotland winning 4-2, if that even mattered. What did matter, whether we think then or now that it was right or wrong to play, was that the disgrace of Pinochet and the plight of the Chilean people was centre stage in Scotland. Members may also be aware of the wonderful Chilean singer, teacher and poet, Victor Hara, who is probably the most famous political activist tortured and murdered by Pinochet's regime. I came to know his story in the 1980s through 
a song by Arlo Guthrie and sung by our own Arthur Johnston. Victor's, Victor Harris' songs were about love, peace and social justice promoted by Salvador Allende and his government. And for that, he was tortured and murdered and his body thrown onto the streets of Santiago. Justice finally caught up only two months ago, presiding officer, with eight of these officers held responsible for his murder and they've been imprisoned for 15 years. Arlo Guthrie's lovely version of Victor Hara's hands being both gentle and strong can apply in equal measure to our Scottish workers who stood by the people of Chile when they needed us and who were rightly honoured by the Chilean government for their solidarity. And it must also apply to my unknown Chilean friend who reached out to me in 1977 to share with me the truth about what was happening in his beloved country. We'll salute all of them today and congratulations once again to Linda Fabiani for bringing this to the attention of the Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Joanne Lamont, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much. And um, can I congratulate everyone who's been involved in what I think has been a very um, powerful debate, and particularly to Linda Fabiani for uh, laying out for us all um, just the impact of the story of what the East Kilbride workers did and quite rightly displaying the pride she has in workers who came from the community that she represents. The inspirational story um, of these Kilbride workers almost leaves you without the right words to match that, what that meant but, and the film Ne Passaran itself. As someone who was privileged to be at the medal ceremony, I felt it was all the more inspirational because of the quiet humorous, understated testimony of the men involved in this great act of courage. And I want to salute them and the film, which I think is a worthy celebration of the actions they took and recognising that it did take courage. It did require individual leadership, but it also brought collective determination. And that for me, if you have both of those things, you can move mountains and you can change the world. And I think this is a celebration of the capacity of people to do the right thing when they're not guaranteed credit for it and nobody's looking to celebrate them. They do it because they believe it to be right. For people of my generation, Chile is unbelievably significant. I was still a school student at the time of the coup. I remember a growing awareness of a very significant international event playing out and the horrors in Chile being relayed on the television. And it, like South Africa, helped shape my political thinking like many people of my generation. Developing an understanding of what power was, how its abuses um, and its consequence of that abuse played out, not just on an international stage, but directly on individuals and families. I saw as a young woman the impact of these events playing out locally with Chilean people coming into communities and being housed in Glasgow and elsewhere. I remember an elderly friend of my parents who came from Skye talking warmly about the new Chilean neighbours that had come. And he was asking questions about why they were there, but also reaching out to them with a typical Hebridean kindness to make them feel um, at home. I also remember meeting a student describing from Chile what it was like to have no means of identifying who you were, what your qualifications were. He went to uh, university with my brother, but that idea of being stateless, homeless, and how frightening that was had a huge impact on me. But also I think it, it, I was aware of the communities welcoming people who were fleeing these troubles and individual acts of kindness, which like the East Kilbride workers, trying to make a difference for those who uh, were in trouble. I too remember the Adam McNaughton song, which starts with talking about the blood on the grass and then ends up with the blood on our hands. But the capacity in that song, in that campaign, to talk about the ordinariness of a football stadium being a place where we saw a somewhere for a, a footballing sporting event to take place, but which had actually been a place where people were slaughtered and murdered. And I think Willie Coffey is so right to highlight the song about Victor Hara. I remember as a young woman, learning that in order to silence him in talking and building comfort among the people round about him, they broke his fingers that he might not play his guitar any longer and he continued to sing. And I want to highlight too 
that at that time, I remember as a young student being involved in a campaign to get Madam Allende elected as a rector of Glasgow University. We didn't succeed. Our Labour Club didn't succeed, but we did too play our little part in talking about what it must be like for students like us living in Chile. The role of Chile solidarity in Scotland was really important in bringing people together. I would cite the role of Glasgow Trades Council and the indomitable Jane Mackay, who understood the power of the trade union movement in bringing political campaigning together with practical means of helping those who were suffering in that struggle. And I believe in celebrating the men of East Cobride and the film Nepas Iran, which speaks to that struggle. We celebrate the very best in humanity. Too often our debate, I believe, is debased, but we should draw on those who not only talked the language of solidarity, but lived it. It was an inspiration then and an inspiration now and a lesson to us all. Thank you very much. I now call on Fiona Hislop to close for the Government Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, first of all, can I congratulate Linda Fabiani on bringing this debate. I, I would say that the showing of the film Ne Pass Around, which I would strongly recommend, would be a responsibility for the presiding officer and parliamentarians, but I, I would uh, urge everyone uh, to see if we can make sure that that happens. Um, and that's important because I think from a number of the reflections we've heard, some of the answers and the questions would be answered by you know, viewing the film and the documentary itself. Um, I think the importance of this debate from uh, excellent contributions uh, and, and I appreciate the extension of the debate to hear all those contributions. Everyone has brought something different to this very important debate. And Linda Fabiani set out the politics of the time, uh, the harshness and the brutality of that uh, fascist regime. And I think uh, Sandra White, particularly in her remarks, reflected on the importance of this story being of international solidarity and standing up to fascist dictatorship. But I think it's also a story of human and individual morality. And that's also what I took from the film when I had the privilege to see it at its world premiere in March during the Glasgow Film Festival. And as we heard uh, from a number of remarks, including from Willie Coffey, it was the footage. It started, in many ways, the story with film. It was the footage of the uh, Hunter Hawk jets uh, flying and bombing the presidential palace in Santiago, which uh, sparked the response from the East Kilbride workers. But that story has continued. And what's remarkable about the film, and I really want to congratulate um, Felipe uh, Mr. Sierra, uh, because it actually rediscovers and investigates and finds out more that wasn't part of the original story, perhaps, but then it is rediscovered as part of the documentary. And I think that's a, a very uh, strong statement of the power of what can happen now with documentaries and what can happen now in films to make sure that we find out things that we didn't know and the workers certainly didn't know at the time. The film was originally uh, an award-winning 2013 short. Uh, it received uh, funding from Creative Scotland and I'm delighted that it was extended uh, into that full documentary. But that individual morality and that individual solidarity uh, together as part of the trade union uh, movement was something that was so important. And the integrity of Bob Fulton, Robert Somerville, John Keenan and Stuart Barry to act on their beliefs and to stand up in solidarity with the Chilean people was quite, quite uh, inspiring. And in imposing the Pinochet uh, dictatorship, uh, the men were also been ordered, uh, awarded the highest civilian honour uh, to non-Chilean citizens, the order of Bernardo O'Higgins, uh, that medal. And I, I commend the director and the production team for their relentless dedication to bringing the story to light. And as we've heard most likely from uh, Joanne Lamont, many Chileans made their homes in Scotland after their exile. They brought their skills, their expertise and their cultures and they stayed with local families. And there was a, a bond built at that time, which it does endure to today. And of course, in June, here in the Parliament, <coughs> we celebrate World Refugee Day. And that's important to, to recognise those who have had to flee their homes and people still to this day have to flee their homes homes because of their threat to themselves and their families for their beliefs and for their experience for their religion and for other means and so today when we show solidarity support and understanding for those who are fleeing persecution that is part of our story in trying to make sure that solidarity resistance 
and making sure that we reach out to the humanity that exists in this world to overcome all that is bad about the dictatorships that still exist in this world is something that we should be very um, committed to. And in some of the remarks, uh, and I would say to those who haven't seen the film, it really is important you do see the films. I think there was some reference that people said they didn't know what happened with the crates. Well, what's interesting, and part of the film that struck me, was a discovery and the cross-referencing, and that detailed research to cross-reference the capture of reference numbers on crates originally with what was discovered um, in Chile uh, when the documentary makers went back. And I think the other aspect I thought was really striking was that point, and I think it was made by Neil Finley and others, um, that when workers and where individuals make um, acts uh, that is in support of uh, others, uh, that they've never seen, they've never known, uh, and never knowing for decades what that response was. That was captured in the film when we heard the responses from those that were political prisoners about that story. And there's reference to Monica, from Monica Lennon to uh, Dame Judith Hart, and the, the film, and it's very clear that the documentary only states what can be stated, but at the time there was some issues and concerns and perhaps a wondering as to whether the removal of the crates had anything to do with the release of political prisoners, and that's some of the explorations. We don't know the answer to that, but again, that's something that I think uh, is questioned in the film. So in terms also of, of what this means, in terms of what we can do and what we should do, uh, we should always remember, but we should also celebrate individuals as well. And again, what is one of the delightful pieces of the film is that I think as Joanne Elan referred to, was the humorous and understated response of the East Kilbride workers. And actually, I think that's what makes the film what it is because you can read and you can understand and you can hear documentaries, but I think it's the individual personalities of those, in, of those four men uh, that come across in the film. And you can perhaps start to understand their sense of integrity, morality, but also their sheer dogged determination, perhaps that Thrawn Scott spirit that meant they were gonna do what they wanted to do because they believed it was right. So, presiding officer, um, we've got many responsibilities, not least in this parliament, in relation to what our trade policy is and our human rights experience. Um, I believe that defence diver diversification is the right thing to do. Um, I think in terms of what we can do as a, a country, we have to make sure that we, as a good global citizen, uh, can try and make sure that human rights is understood uh, universally and internationally. Um, I'm very proud to be part of this debate. I think there's some very important messages. I've also learned more about that football situation I wasn't aware of. But the stories of, um, the, of the, the workers are ones that have to be told. And I was very proud when I went to the premiere that I took my young son uh, to see that film. And he said to me, why do we not know about this story? This is part of not just Chilean history, it's also part of Scottish history. And so therefore, I would encourage everyone to uh, view the film um, as, if they can, um, to make sure that uh, we live our lives both individually and politically with that sense of integrity and morality. And wherever in the world we see injustice, wherever in, we, in the world that we see um, those uh, whose political rights and human rights um, are compromised, and wherever we can seek peace and, and solidarity in this world, we should always uh, embark to carry out our responsibilities to make sure that we do good uh, as we can. Ne Pasaran charts a dark period of Chilean history, but it's a story that should be told, but it tells a modern uh, story of solidarity, of compassion, of the human spirit, both in Chile, but also here um, in Scotland. Our international connections are important, but simple actions can have a lasting impact. I'd like to express my admiration for everyone who's involved in the making of the film. I'd like to pay tribute to all those from across Scotland and beyond who stood and stand in solidarity with people across the world, but particularly uh, at that point with the Chilean people. And to Bob Fulton, to Robert Somerville, to John Keenan, to Stuart Barry, and to Felipe Bustos Sierra, we salute you. Thank you. Um, uh, that concludes the debate. And can I thank all members for their contributions? And I'm sure Ms. Fabiani knows how to progress the showing of a film in Parliament. I don't need to tell her how to do that. Uh, I then suspend this meeting until 2.30.